What's going on, everybody? This is another episode of the I Test Takes podcast. This is episode 20. Um, in this episode, we are going to be recapping the championship weekend uh, between the AFC and the NFC, of course. Uh, we're also going to do a little bit of head coaching uh, you know, news, some of the new hires that we've had since last pod. Uh, and then we're also going to preview uh, the Super Bowl matchup, of course, this year. Uh, let's just get right into uh, – I'm just going to go n- go ahead and start with the head coaching news in this one. Uh, first off, my Philadelphia Eagles, they selected their head coach, Nick Sirianni. He is the former offensive coordinator for the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, obviously a Frank Reich underling. He's bringing on for his defensive coordinator, Jonathan Gannon, and then as his OC, uh, Shane Steichen, who worked with him in uh, San Diego at that time when he was working with the Chargers uh, years back when they were still San Diego instead of L.A. Um, And Jonathan Gannon worked with Nick Sirianni within the Colts organization as the defensive backs coach. And so he's coming on. And so is Shane Steichen going to come on to kind of fill out that the top piece, that kind of trifecta uh, as the Eagles, you know, go into the future here. Nick Sirianni, offensive minded head coach, obviously Uh, looks like he's been able to develop quarterbacks and wide receivers throughout his career in the NFL. Uh, He has quite a bit of experience. He doesn't have any head coaching experience. He actually never even called plays as the OC in Indianapolis under Frank Reich. Uh, But Frank Reich and a lot of other people have come out uh, and said great things about him so far. Um, From what I've heard in in little mini interviews that he's done throughout the years, uh, it seems like he's he's the type of guy, he's like super energetic, uh, seems like he's really passionate, more of like a player's coach, which I appreciate. I think that's that goes a long ways in, you know, the locker room in the NFL. Um, But he's also like schematically. Very similar to Frank Reich, which is you know obviously the guy that, that was the offensive coordinator for the Eagles in the 2017 and 2016 season, uh, where obviously the Eagles had a lot of success in those two years, especially the Super Bowl year under Frank Reich calling plays. Um, well, not necessarily calling plays, designing plays and calling plays, uh, stuff of that nature in general. Um, a lot of people like to give credit to Frank Reich for a lot of the, the successes of the 2017 season. Uh, especially with the way that things have turned out in the last couple years with just Doug Peterson as that you know guy that, that's play designing as well as doing the scheme and calling plays on game day. So we'll see if the Frank Reich underling Nick Sirianni uh, can come in and kind of turn the Eagles around. Uh, there's you know the rumors that uh, Nick Sirianni is primarily supposed to come in and, and attempt to fix Carson Wentz. Uh, it's going to take a lot. I don't know if it's going to go through. I don't know. It's supposedly it's up to Nick Sirianni to decide whether he wants to keep Carson Wentz uh, or trade him in this off season. Uh, that's going to be a huge deci- decision. Um, but I think I would try to get Wentz back on track if possible. Uh, I just saw at the end of the year there. I just see too many roadblocks in the way for the development of Jalen Hurts. I, I think he can be a very good. Uh, like backup in the league, uh, but I just the top end, like he's got a super high floor, but not a super high ceiling. Uh, Wentz does have a low floor, but he has an unbelievably high ceiling, in my opinion. So that's just where I'm at. Uh, of course, like I said, Eagles hired Nick Sirianni. We'll see how it goes. It's a it's a very interesting hire. He's a young guy, so we'll see. But uh, next is going to be, and I kind of alluded to it in the last podcast. The Detroit Lions did hire Dan Campbell uh, to be their head coach. Um, everybody's probably seen it by now. The Dan Campbell, you know, head coaching interview where he's talking about biting people's kneecaps off and stuff. It was absolutely outrageous. It was hilarious. Uh, he seems like one of those super rah rah guys when it comes to you know coaching in the NFL. Um, and he he wants to, as he quoted in his interview, that. He wants to take on the personality of the city of Detroit. And it seemed like he knew what he was talking about. He's pl- He actually played football. He played tight end in the NFL for Detroit. So it's kind of one of those like cool stories where he gets to come back and at least you know contribute, be the coach of the team now. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And lastly, the Houston Texans, 
That situation continues to get more and more ugly with Deshaun Watson definitely doubling down on the fact that he wants out of there. Uh, they're still in the process of interviewing head coaches right now. They have Eric Bieniemy on the schedule to uh, have an interview. They have Leslie Frazier uh, on, you know, you know, scheduled to interview as well. Uh, he's a defensive coordinator, obviously. Um, he's been around the league for a while as well. Obviously, Eric Bieniemy is the offensive coordinator for the Kansas City Chiefs. They're obviously going to be going on to the Super Bowl this year. Uh, and they also have, which is super controversial, uh, you know, at face value, have interviewed or are planning to interview Josh McCown, which is literally a player for them last year. So just just to put the cherry on top of the dysfunction going on in that that whole organization right now, they're they're interviewing a player that played for them last year, and he was actually poached off of the Eagles practice squad last year to be on the Texans active roster halfway through the season. Um, and I mean, I, I'm a big fan of Josh McCown. I think at some point in time, he will be a great head coach if that's what he decides to do, you know, with the rest of his career. Uh, but this seems super premature and it just seems like they're, they're really desperate and they're reaching at this point just to try to get something going. And of course um, there's just a lot more qualified people out there at this point And just for them to kind of almost, you know, slap some of those people in the face with that interview for Josh McCown seems, like I said, just dysfunctional at best. All right, so that's pretty much it for the head coaching stuff. Like I said, I'll, you know, say something whenever uh, the Houston Texans decide to do something with their head coaching vacancy, but right now, that's all I have for them. Uh, let's just jump right into these games that we're going to be recapping. We're going to start with the NFC uh, championship game. It was the first game of the of the day there. And it was obviously Green Bay versus Tampa Bay. And I have a lot of thoughts about this game. And this is just going to be kind of raw emotion, just kind of off the dome. I don't really write a whole bunch of stuff down when I'm doing these podcasts. I just kind of go off the top of my head a lot of times. And this one's going to be straight from the heart because I am not going to lie. I was very salty that <laughs> the Green Bay Packers lost that game um, and that Tampa Bay won. And let me let me start here though. Even though it hurts me to say, congratulations to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Tom Brady. They won the game. Tampa Bay deserves to you know go back to the Super Bowl. Obviously, uh, they're a, a good team this year, a great team this year actually, um, and their fan base really kind of deserves this. Uh, I think it's gonna be gonna be really cool to see. You know, Tampa Bay get to play in their home stadium. That's kind of been a big deal people are making out of this right now. Um, but it is going to be kind of cool to see, you know, the first team to host their own Super Bowl, basically. So that's cool. Um, obviously, Tom Brady gets the job done. Uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense gets the job done. And they beat the, the Packers in this one. Um, but let me go into this, just dive into this a little bit deeper. Kevin King for the Green Bay Packers should be ashamed of himself. He let up every single big play and conversion possible. Literally, when Tampa Bay needed something big to happen for their team, they targeted him, and it worked, I mean, at least 95% of the time. Uh, I mean, he's in every still picture of, you know, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers scoring yesterday. Uh, the first... In, or the first touchdown he let go uh, was Mike Evans. He, he let Mike Evans get behind him, and then he completely just timed his jump terribly to try to contest that ball. He was already beat. He knew he was late on it, and he tried to jump. And you know, people on Twitter are saying, man, Kevin King hit that Y button when he was playing Madden like a minute too early. And he jumped up, completely whiffed. Michael, Mike Evans literally just caught the ball with no problem in the end zone. And that's the way the game started out for Green Bay on, on defense, and it didn't get much better um, until the second half, really. Um, and right after that, more or less, I mean, Kevin King gets absolutely beat by Scotty Miller to close that close out the half. And that like just the fact that you had six seconds left and Tampa Bay was already driving. And basically, they didn't have any timeouts left. 
if they threw to the middle of the field, time was going to expire, uh, and they wouldn't have been able to get you know a field goal attempt or anything. So basically, you're covering a quick out route to get them into better field goal position with six seconds left, which means they couldn't have got too much yardage because the play is going to have to develop at some point. So you're defending out routes to go out of bounds, and you're defending bombs going over your head so they don't score a touchdown with six seconds left. And Kevin King just lets Scotty Miller get behind him. I mean, Scotty Miller literally, as soon as he comes off the the ball, he sticks his head down and is just sprinting as fast as he can. And Tom Brady just let it rip. And Kevin King wasn't within five feet of him. I mean, how do you let this happen? Uh, And then, obviously, there was the Aaron Jones fumble. He fumbled twice in the game. One was actually recovered by Robert Tunyon and really saved that possession in general. And then Aaron Jones fumbles again and gives the ball back to Tampa Bay, basically on like somewhere near the 10 yard line, basically all the way in their territory. And they go down and score again. I think that was the Leonard Fournette run for a touchdown. Kevin King's also in that picture with his face down in the dirt after Leonard Fournette runs through like three Packers defenders. So the whole first half starts out awful for Green Bay. Uh, they couldn't get a whole lot going on offense. Really, the only thing they, they could get going was the one big play from Aaron Rodgers just throwing a dime to uh, MSV, Marquez Valdez-Scantling. And that was pretty much the biggest play they had going then. Um, and then, finally, in the second half, Green Bay catches fire. Aaron Rodgers catches fire. And they start to put some points on the board. But I mean, there's just pivotal moments where things just went wrong for Green Bay. Like when they went to the red zone, they were on uh, either the five or three. It was inside the five-yard line. And Rodgers throws the ball to Devontae Adams. He gets open on the route against uh, Carlton Davis and just drops the ball. And you just don't see that very often from Devontae Adams, obviously. Uh, But it was just one of those days where it, it felt like the pressure was on some of those players and they were just not ready for it. And so Devontae Adams drops that one. I'm pretty sure they just get a field goal out of that possession. And that stunts, you know, obviously the comeback there. But Green Bay, like I said, continues to put points on the board. They make a comeback. Uh, But then when it comes down to the end of the game there, Aaron Rodgers did miss one opportunity to throw a touchdown to Alan Lazard uh, instead of trying to force feed the ball to Devontae Adams. So that's on Rodgers. He didn't see it. Um, and then also he, there was a, you know, a chance that on that one play where Aaron Rodgers could have possibly ran the ball. We don't really know what he was seeing in that play in that exact moment. So I'm not going to judge him too heavily, but I think he probably could have ran it at least if he wouldn't have got into the end zone, it probably would have been close, which would have made the decision for Matt LaFleur to go for the fourth and goal a lot more easier if it's closer than a fourth and eight. Um, but in the end, the play calling was just inexcusable for Matt LaFleur. Just the fact that he was too much of a coward to go for it on fourth down on both of those times they had fourth and goal with Aaron Rodgers at the helm. I mean, undebatably, in my opinion, he is at least a top five QB to ever play football. Uh, And in my opinion, he's the best to ever do it. And you refuse to let him try to get you know, a score or a touchdown, I should say, on fourth down within five yards or even maybe a little bit further out. But it it doesn't matter. It's Aaron Rodgers. Just give him the opportunity. You're, you're kicking field goals. You're making, you know, the possessions just – it's almost a waste when you're kicking those field goals, especially by how much they were down in the game at one point. So that was just – on Matt LaFleur's part, that was just cowardice, and it was it was really disappointing to see considering how good of a year he had all year. So, obviously, um, and then I, just the to end the game, it's, it just seems super standard, the fact that Tom Brady gets a call at the end of the game. I mean, obviously, it is a hold. Kevin King, once again, getting roasted on a route by Tyler Johnson. He grabs his undershirt and is pulling it, and it's stretching a mile long because he's that far behind the receiver once again. And, of course, the the refs throw the flag. And, that I mean, they've been letting them play all game long, so that's been controversial as well. I mean, they were were hand fighting. They were bumping each other all game long, playing tough. 
and the rest were letting them play until that exact moment. I don't know how you make that call with the way they were officiating the entire rest of the game, but they did uh, because it just it was just too blatant, and it's just really unfortunate that that's the way it goes down because obviously earlier in the game there was the controversial uh, Sean Murphy bunting grabs Alan Lazard by the shoulder pad and kind of rips him close to him and then intercepts the ball, which is the only real mistake that Aaron Rodgers made, which wasn't even really his mistake because he put the ball where he needed to, but the defender made a play in quotations, you could say. And so it was just a a whole lot of craziness going on in that game, but obviously Tom Brady gets it done. Aaron Rodgers, once again, fails to go to the Super Bowl, unfortunately, loses in the NFC Championship game, as he's done many times before. And I would argue many of the times were not because of his play. If you just look at the side-by-side of Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers' statistics in this game, uh, you would think that Tom Brady would have lost the game. Um, But he ends up winning. His defense, in my opinion, carried him in this one. Uh, Because he made some boneheaded plays. I mean, just throwing the ball up for grabs three different times. The Packers never actually stopped the Tampa Bay offense. Tom Brady stopped the Tampa Bay offense three separate times with interceptions. It was just the defense for Tampa Bay only let six points come of those interceptions and turnovers from the Green Bay offense. And, I mean, basically, I knew coming into this game – the one way that Tampa Bay was going to win this game would be to stop the running game, which they were able to do. Aaron Jones leaves the game, I'm pretty sure, after that fumble. Uh, and he's obviously their most explosive running back. And Jamal Williams is okay. Uh, uh, A.J. Dillon is is okay as well. He's a rookie. And they had to you know take on the bulk of the running game after that. And they're just not as explosive. And they, they can't break off those game-changing runs like Aaron Jones could. Uh, But Tampa Bay just stifled them in the run game, which then caused Green Bay to be very one-dimensional and just kind of make the run game out of bubble screens and stuff like that. And so when you make Green Bay one-dimensional and you only have one real weapon on the outside in Devontae Adams, uh, it's going to be hard to move the ball on a good defense. And Tampa Bay has a good defense and a great defensive coordinator in Todd Bowles. So... That's just my full-blown opinion of that game. I'm just disappointed that Aaron Rodgers – we just don't get to see Aaron Rodgers versus Pat Mahomes in the Super Bowl. And that's just the one I wanted to see. I obviously picked Green Bay in this game, so I was wrong on that one. Um, But it is what it is. Let's move on to the AFC Championship game where, obviously, Kansas City and the Buffalo Bills were playing. Kansas City uh, starts out a little slow. Uh, Buffalo jumps out to a 9-0 lead on Kansas City. Uh, I think they came down, scored a field goal, and then they punted the ball to Kansas City on another possession, and Miko Hardman fumbles the or muffs the punt, and it goes down to the Kansas City 2. Buffalo punches it right in, and it seems like all the momentum's in Buffalo's you know hands at that point. I mean, big momentum shift, and then all of a sudden Kansas City got an opportunity to actually put together a real drive, and they went down and scored, and then Kansas City continued to score again, and they scored again, and Buffalo continued to go down and just put field goals on the on the board, and at one point in the game, I don't even know what the score was at this point, um, but I just looked to uh, my girlfriend's brother and said, Look, if if Buffalo does not score a touchdown on this next possession, it's going to get ugly. And they went down and kicked another field goal. And I knew right then and there, Kansas City was not going to lose that game. And from then on, Kansas City, it it just looked like they were playing with them. Um, Obviously, Buffalo was a good team this year. uh, But they just ran into a buzzsaw that, that wasn't playing or wasn't running on all cylinders throughout the entire regular season this year. But... When Kansas City wants to, they can do whatever they want to for the most part. And Pat Mahomes put on a clinic of just like, what can what kind of crazy stuff can I do with my arm? Just the, the arm angles he's using, just getting sacked 
and throwing the ball, basically falling on the ground, completing passes, doing crazy stuff. Tyreek Hill showing out, taking a slant like 71 yards. Uh, uh, Travis Kelsey was unguardable once again. Buffalo had trouble guarding him in the first matchup, and he's basically guaranteed for 100 yards every game he plays in because Patrick Mahomes and him have the chemistry of, like, Peyton Manning and Dallas Clark. It's, like, it's such a good uh, just pairing that, like, and it's just crazy to watch. If you just watch what Travis Kelsey and Patrick Mahomes can do without communicating when they're in the middle of a play. I mean, Patrick Mahomes can be running out of the pocket and then just give Travis Kelsey a look. And Travis Kelsey, all he'll do, is, it's so subtle, but it's so good, where he, he'll just shift right or left by like a foot or even less. And it'll put him in position to have leverage over whatever defender might be in his vicinity. And Patrick Mahomes then puts the ball in a place where the defender can't get to it. And then it gives Travis Kelsey a chance to make somebody miss and then take the ball off the field. It's just wild. Uh, Kansas City, once again, locking down on defense again. Uh, They picked Josh Allen off twice in this one. And whenever, like, it's basically like I said with the offense, I mean, whenever they want to, they can turn that switch on and they are a lockdown defense. They're not, like, the best in all of football, obviously. Tampa Bay's defense is actually the best left, and obviously they're the the last two left. Um, But Kansas City can play defense. That's been proven over the last two years now. Steve Spagnuolo is a very smart defensive coordinator, and he puts together great game plans and game-specific game plans for whoever he's playing and I'm really curious to see how he deploys his guys against uh, Tampa Bay and Tom Brady. Uh, but, yeah, so Kansas City basically ran away with this game, and Kansas City was just the better team. That was very obvious from from the jump for the most part, other than when the game started out, and it was just a crazy, you know, just few events there for the Buffalo Bills to jump out to that lead. But, yeah, so let's just get into this Super Bowl matchup. It's going to be a great one. Actually, uh, even though it's not the one that I wanted and I, I think it probably would have been a little bit better of a Super Bowl, you can't complain about the Mahomes versus Tom Brady storylines. I mean, it is what it is. It's what the consensus is, the GOAT and Tom Brady, and then the up and coming like potential chance that this guy, Patrick Mahomes, can take over that mantle as being the GOAT at some point in his career. Uh, just depends on how the rest of, rest of his career, you know, arc goes, but um, he can really get to that point. That's for sure. So this is going to be an inter- interesting matchup. Obviously, I think in this one, once again, just kind of like with the Green Bay game, um, Tampa Bay is going to look to probably make Kansas City one dimensional. Um, but Kansas City almost makes themselves one dimensional at times because they realize that their strength is their passing game and they're not going to completely go away from it, you know, at any stretch in in the game. Um, And Kansas City right now, with their running back situation, um, they're really just kind of deploying Darrell Williams and um, Clyde Edwards-Lair. He actually was back for this game game against uh, Buffalo, and he actually scored a touchdown. Um, But I just think that Tampa Bay's run defense is going to be the key in this one. If they can stuff that that running attack, which, I mean, isn't super prevalent for Kansas City, but if they can have the ability to make Kansas City one-dimensional and then have just a, a prayer for stopping anything Kansas City does in the passing game, they'll have a chance to win this game. Uh, I almost forgot that Kansas City and Tampa Bay played earlier in this season. Uh, it was actually Week 12, and the reason why I was thinking about it was, you know, in this game – where Tampa Bay was playing Green Bay, I was thinking about Kevin King getting roasted. Um, and in Week 12, when it was Kansas City versus Tampa Bay, the guy getting roasted in that game and was being made fun of was Carlton Davis. And he was having a pretty good season up, up until that point. And he just got the Tyreek Hill bug. And uh, they were leaving him on an island with him. And they gave him a little bit of safety help here and there. Um, but Todd Bowles seemed to be a little bit too... Uh, stubborn to give him too much help on that side with Tyreek Hill. And that's when Tyreek Hill basically had 200 yards in the first half. And that was a a wild game. The end score makes it look a lot 
better of a game than it actually was. I think the end score was Kansas City won by uh, 27 to 24. Uh, but that's where basically Brady in the, in the fourth quarter kind of made a little bit of a comeback and, and made it a semi-interesting finish. Uh, it was just a lot of garbage time, in my opinion. Um, but, yeah, Carlton Davis basically single-handedly got them out of that game because, well, I wouldn't even blame Carlton Davis. He's just trying to do his job, and he's not he's not going to guard Tyreek Hill one-on-one. So I put more of that on Todd Bowles, uh, being too stubborn to, to give him a lot of help over there. Uh, but, I mean, it that's the, you know – the the poison that you have to pick it's either give help to Tyreek Hill or give help to Travis Kelsey or I mean that's the that's the point of Kansas City Kansas City being so explosive it's just you can't guard them all so you have to really pick your poison with them and so I think in this game really it's just going to come down to like I said Tampa Bay getting you know, making Kansas City be one dimensional. Kansas City on defense, if they can get to Brady early um, and often and hit him, that's always the downfall of Tom Brady. If he gets hit early, he usually starts to falter a little bit. Um, if he gets, if he starts feeling that pressure, kind of kind of like he did in the Green Bay game, where in the second half he played a not great game once again because he was just throwing up ducks whenever pressure was getting near him. I mean, free rusher comes. Tam, Tom Brady at this point in his career is chucking it and hoping. One of his giant receivers can go get it. If it's Michael Evans uh, or Gronk, he's just hoping somebody's going to go out there and catch it. So, I mean, it's it's kind of a calculated risk for Tom Brady, but at the same time, like, that's just a, a not not a great football play in general. Just If he can just get out of the way, but he, he's just too slow to get out of the way of a free rusher at this point in his career. So, I mean, I think in my opinion – uh, it should be, and I hate calling my shot. I hate doing this because I feel like, and I'm just a superstitious person in general. I hate going and saying that something's going to happen and trying to predict something. And then when it backfires, I think it's my fault just because I don't know. Maybe I'm just an idiot, but basically I'm calling Kansas city's winning this one. Uh, I really don't think the game's going to be that close. It might play out pretty similarly to the way it happened in Week 12. Not saying that Tyree Hill is going to have 200 yards in the first half, but I think it's probably going to be one of those games where Kansas City jumps out on them and just steamrolls them, and then Tom Brady makes a bit of a comeback, and and people start you know getting a little tight, getting a little hot and bothered, like oh, is he going to actually do this again? Is he going to do, pull the Atlanta Falcons? And I just don't think it's going to be enough. And Patrick Mahomes is going to have his second ring in, in two years. Should have been third ring in three years, if you ask me. Thanks, D. Ford. Um, but, yeah, so Patrick Mahomes, Super Bowl, probably going to be the Super Bowl MVP once again if, you know, they do win the game. I don't see, you know, a, a game scenario where one of the other guys gets MVP unless it's Travis Kelsey and he has, dang, like close to 200 yards himself or Tyra Kill has close to 200 yards in the game. Um, it's probably going to go to Patrick Mahomes, unless like I mean there there could be the situation where maybe there's a defensive play that that happens that it changes the tide of the game or something like that. Maybe a ty- like a Tyron Matthew pick six or something. But either way, somebody's going to have to have an unbelievable game to take the MVP away from Patrick Mahomes because he's the obviously the guy that get the, he's the engine that runs that team. So that's pretty much all I got for that one. Um, once again. I appreciate everybody listening and tuning in. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, like the channel, share the channel if you don't mind. We are actually on a lot of podcast platforms at this point in time. Uh, We're on Spotify. We're on Google Apps. um, We're on, I think, uh, Breaker. There's a there's a lot of different platforms we're on now. We're still waiting to get a confirmation back from Apple Podcasts to be on their platform. Um, But yeah, just. If you guys just could listen, um, just subscribe to us on, on those platforms as well. And we appreciate everybody supporting us. Shout out to my producer, Weston, once again. Uh, follow us on Twitter and on Instagram, at iTestTakes, and on TikTok, at iTestTakes as well. And uh, we'll talk to you next week after the Super Bowl. We'll do a little bit of recap there. Peace.